uh, is that uh, it seems to be going after facilities in Iran, and it seems to be going after certain specific facilities, perhaps nuclear related. And, and if, and I'm, this is a huge if, if there's any accuracy in that at all, you can start narrowing down very quickly who might be, in your minds, the actors for this. Uh, I don't know exactly what has happened. Uh, that's probably a good thing that I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm completely honest with you. I don't know the background of, uh, of, of this. But it's a very interesting development, and it points the way towards, like you say, I teach cyber war. This might be an example of, of something that would be useful in a, in a, in a military or, a stri or, or a very strategic context. Uh, it involves it involves systems that we call SCADA. That stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, S-C-A-D-A. -E and that's the means by which, for example, coming coming here on the on the Ave this morning, there, the guy isn't driving that train. He's in front, but he's not driving it. The computer is driving it. It's going too fast. Things are happening too fast. There's too much information for the human being to do it. The computer is doing it. We had an example in Washington, D.C. last summer of what happens when that goes wrong. Uh, in our subway system, the, the metro, uh, late in the afternoon one day, uh, up on the red line, and, and I've been on that train, and I've been in that car. Came around a bend, and, and the operator in horror saw that there was a train stopped on her track about 150 yards ahead. And she slammed on the emergency brake, and she died in her post trying to stop the train. So did eight of her passengers. Because when it collided, uh, the car went in a cordial like this and just folded up. Eight people died and squashed. What caused that? And it wasn't a human being's error. Something went wrong in the SCADA system in which that train up there where it stopped, something is supposed to report back to the central metro subway system computer. There's a train stop right there. I better tell the oncoming train to start slowing down. And something happened, and that connection wasn't made. And so she came around at 60 miles an hour, and there it was, and nine people died. That's an example of what can happen when those control mechanisms fail. The problem for us is we don't see them, we don't think about them, they are utterly and completely invisible to us until something goes wrong. And unfortunately, when something goes wrong, it tends to go wrong in a very big and very visible way, like that, like that accident. There's another example. <coughs> this may be more familiar to you. I hadn't heard about this until uh, a month or so ago when I was giving a lecture at our Air Command and Staff College. And someone came and said, did you see this? This came off the Internet. And it was a, a, a news investigation report in Spain, in Europe, uh, about an airliner crash in Spain two years ago, a jet. 154 people died. And if not the direct cause, at least a contributing cause, was someone had put a thumb drive into one of the plane's computer systems. And that thumb drive had junk in it. And the malware infected the aircraft computer systems so that it either caused something to go wrong or when something went wrong, the airplane couldn't respond to it. 154 people dead. If that's an accident, it's a tragedy, maybe, maybe negligence, and if someone did that on purpose, it starts getting real close to what you might call cyber terrorism. And if you did that in wartime, it might be real close to what you would call cyber warfare. The problem is that we as citizens don't see or think about those systems and those technologies that make that stuff operate. Uh, Right up the street here, down the street, you have traffic lights and you have little warning devices for walking. There's no human being operating those. Computers are operating those. And increasingly, uh, I've, got the, I've got the book with me back uh, in my room. I just finished reading it on the flight over here. And you can get it from Amazon, put it on your Kindle. Uh, a book called Cyber War by Dick Clark. I know Dick. Uh, he used to be the president's advisor for this. 
and this is something which is becoming increasingly plausible, increasingly possible, uh, and the problem is that for a variety of reasons, uh, governments, especially ours, have proven to be fairly incapable, and speaking of my own government, incompetent uh, about getting a control on the possibilities of these things happening because uh, the private sector controls it. There's a, uh, there's a study being done, <coughs> I don't think it's done yet, called NATO 2020. And it's, it's, it's an effort that's intended to look forward a, another decade as to where NATO should be going, uh, what the issues might be, etc. The new strategic concept? Yes, the new strategic and concept. Be provided by November? Yes. Uh, in that, in, the, in the, uh, the preliminary work that's been done, uh, there's a statement that the, the next great threat to NATO might come down a fiber optic cable. That's an interesting argument, and it gets at that issue of someone may choose as their most effective means of doing something to NATO or to any NATO member uh, operating in this information environment. This, that's a form of connectivity. <coughs> and and what, what, the, what the fiber optic is carrying is called content. Content might be really bad stuff. NATO is, is struggling with what this all means because, as you mentioned, when the events happened in Estonia in, in late spring 2007, the Estonians sort of said, is this an Article 5 issue? And, as I like to put it, the great sucking sound you heard was <gasps> of my, almost all the NATO members of, oh, oh, oh wait a minute, what, what are they talking about? Let's uh, invade Russia. <laughs> yes, uh, let's not. <laughs> Well, you know, Estonia and Russia had, have, had a bilateral agreement in cyber that if something should happen, they will consult each other. And when it happened, the Estonians picked up the phone and started dialing and no one has yet answered that phone at the other end. Uh, in, in the next year, in Georgia, where, where it was two weeks ago, you really had what may well have been cyber war. And as I often make the argument, the, uh, <coughs> you have both kinetics, physical things, you have Russian tanks, planes, artillery, etc., driving towards Tbilisi, and you have cyber things as well. Uh, you may have seen the, uh, <coughs> the, the imagery. Someone, some Russian, don't know who, uh, got inside of the web, six blind Indians brought not American Indians, Indian Indians, brought to an elephant and cast to describe it. One grabs the, the tusk and says, oh, an elephant, it's like a spear, it's hard and sharp. One grabs the trunk, so an elephant, it's like, a, it's like a snake, it's like a huge muscle. One grabs a leg, oh, an elephant's like a tree going up to the sky. One is against the side, oh, it's, an elephant's like the side of a house or a wall. One grabs the ears, or flapping is like a huge leaf on a, on a tree. And they're all right in describing that piece of the elephant. The problem is that in the American information operations community, in, in the government as a whole, we all want to say, ah, my piece is the elephant. No, it's not. In fact, it, it's so bad that <coughs> I, I believe that, that some people in some of our organizations and agencies will be perfectly willing to see other <coughs> organizations and agencies get crippled as long as their resources and budgets, etc., are protected. And if you let that happen, what's, what the result's going to be that uh, you're going to have a tusk, <coughs> and it'll be the greatest tusk ever made, but the elephant, the beast that the tusk belongs to, will no longer be able to function. And that's the problem I think we're working towards. Uh, that's the problem that governments have. And, and that's the reason I use the word, you know, it was a fortunate choice of words, <coughs> incompetent, uh, in that <laughs> it's the problem that Howard Schmidt has of being the national coordinator. He's got no budget, he's got no authority. Uh, as Dick Clark very painfully makes obvious in this book they just published called Cyber War, 
uh, at the bureaucratic headquarters back in Washington that you have the problem. I bet you have the same problem between Madrid and. Uh, I'll just leave that alone. <coughs> it's that's in the nature of, of, of bureaucracies. Uh, if you are <coughs> a, a, a friend of mine, Jeff Jones and I and two others published an article last year. I think last year in in something called Joint Force Quarterly, which is a journal that our NDU publishes, called Strategic Communication and the Theater Commander. And it was kind of an exploration of, of what strategic communication is, and then some very specific suggestions for military commanders, and, and they apply at all levels. My main contribution to that was something that I called the, the influence cycle. It's a piece I've been working on for, for a long time. And essentially, what the, the, what the influence cycle does is, are you familiar with something called the OODA loop? Mm -hmm. This goes back 40 years in American military thought, but there's a, there's a concept that came out of fighter pilot operations, but applies to lots of things militarily. It, we call it the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. Every, organiz every, every organization is, or, or individual, commander, fighter pilot, whatever, is constantly observing <coughs> the operational environment. If, if I can observe better and faster what's going on in that environment than you can, I have an advantage. If I can then orient myself as to, oh, and here's what this means faster than you, I've increased that advantage. If I can make a decision about what to do faster than you can make a decision, I begin increase that advantage. And if I can do something, act, because of that decision based upon the orientation coming from the observation, then I have a huge advantage. And the advantage might be the difference between life and death. But that's, that's very short term. That's, sometimes those things happen in nanoseconds. If I'm trying to influence a society 